I'm Jordan. And I'm Rosanna. And on this podcast, we explore how to take life off autopilot and relentlessly pursue a life worth living together. Hello, and welcome to season two, episode one of the Relentless Pursuit podcast. New season, who dis? We got some new mic stands here. We are um, working on just getting better, getting a little bolder, and taking next steps to kind of grow this podcast a little bit. Yeah, so the mic stands you're saying is a, a major step in that direction. Major step. We have <laughs> mic stands now and uh, a plant on the table that my husband wanted to put on the table. So mm-hmm. um, we can't believe that we're already kicking off season two. We've had a little bit of a break, about four weeks uh, between the first and second season. And you know we've started recording and planning for a while, but we're ready to jump in. And we're so excited that you are here joining us today. So we, you know we had a few objectives when we began this project. Um, when we were kind of dreaming it up, there were three things that really stood out to us that we wanted to accomplish in the year 2020. Um, and the first was to spend some time together. Right. And that's, that's really the priority is like just making sure we're doing something for something for us. That is, I think, a great excuse to spend even more time together. Right. And so some people like go to the movies or take walks. Um, we're just a little weird. We started a <laughs> podcast. Um, the second part of it, and I think maybe the reason why we did it in the form of a podcast was that we wanted to create something together that had value and that we could be proud of. So we've taken on some different kinds of projects together over the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is something that has value beyond some kind of like a monetary value. Right. And I think there's a lot of ways to spend quality time together and uh, a lot that we enjoy. And this is one of those ways. So it's a chance not just to create a memory or an experience or, you know, like like go to the movies is a great activity to enjoy and and mutually share. Um, But I I really like the idea of working on something together, creating something that we both um, can can share and have some ownership over. Yeah. And the third thing was that we wanted to be able to share what we were doing with other people in the hopes that we could have an impact on them Mm -hmm. and share some of what we're learning (laughs) and what we're doing and how we're growing. And that's kind of in parentheses. It's like, and share it with others. Hopefully it will have a positive (laughs) impact on them. It certainly has been for us. So we've really just kind of greatly enjoyed all of this. Um, Every time we talk about the podcast or we're thinking about it or we're planning for it, um, it brings a lot of joy to us. So we just wanted to say thank you to all of those um, who have listened to season one, have been promoting it to your friends and in your circles, who have given us shout outs on social media and left us reviews like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Like this is something that we wanted to do and it's really happening and it's just been really great. So mm-hmm. thank you. Yeah. And it's nice to know that we can uh, you know, like kind of check off those three objectives that we had. Like we are spending time together. We are creating something of value and um, we're, we're sharing it, and we're very grateful that people have let us know that they've gotten something from it, too. All right. Well, without further ado. Here we go. Let's season get two. started. Uh, season two, episode one. This one is titled, The Stories We Tell Ourselves. Yeah, this one is a big one. I'm actually a little nervous going into it because I feel like the more we think about it or explore it, the more there is to talk about because we really realize how pervasive stories and narratives are within our lives and within our communities and within our cultures. So uh, as we get into this topic, um, we realized that we wanted to really kick off season one with this because there's so much that stories do for us um, in in the sense of personally, but also in that sort of meta meta sense of looking at like the the narrative of uh, a nation, the narrative of, you know, mankind. And these are stories that um, really have an enormous role in shaping what we believe and what we end up doing. And I don't think that we can, um, you know, really do justice to a lot of the other topics that are are coming up in this season without starting here, without talking about the stories that influence us. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that we can probably all agree to if we think about it is that humans are storytellers. Like throughout history, people have passed down stories from one generation to the next in an attempt to explain their world, their values, their beliefs, their traditions. Mm -hmm. You know, what 
what comes before them or, you know, from the people that came before them and then passing it down to future generations. And we use those stories to reaffirm our identities, our belongings, and our purpose. Right. And if you think about it, like humans really have this enormous appetite for story. And you you think we would run out of it after a while. But um, I mean, so much of our entertainment from the the movies we watch and, you know, plays, operas, musicals, um, television shows, even video games, and of course, the books that we read, like these are all inundated with stories, these narratives that are you know, you know telling us a, a sequence of events, many of them entirely fictitious, right? Totally made up characters. Uh, and made up events, but they have very real thematic implications for what we choose to believe and apply to our lives. And we're always telling stories. Like think about what makes like the most entertaining conversation is when you get together with others and you're talking about the events that have happened to you or to people that you know, and we're passing those around to one another. Um, I read a, a book called The Storytelling Animal by Jonathan Gottschall. And he, he makes an interesting comparison. He just says, like, just imagine hypothetically, you know, way back in, in mankind's past, there were two tribes. One tribe would kind of go back to their camp or their village each night and study warfare and analyze data. And the other tribe would go back to their camp each night and tell stories. Which one do you think would be more successful? Like you kind of lean towards the first one, like the one that like studies warfare and 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 is like the the scientific analytic kind. Um, but if you look at the course of human history, the 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 kind of community that's more successful is the storytelling kind. And so he goes on, and uh, it's a fantastic book that just explores why humans tell stories. And uh, he gives a whole bunch of examples. Uh, he talks about how Alexander the Great was influenced by the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, Hitler was inspired by Wagner's opera Rienzi. A uh, generation of Americans was invigorated by Uncle Tom's Cabin in the 1850s. Um, so these characters and these events, these themes give all of us like shape and understanding and vision to our lives. Well, but even before that, because these are, I would say, like even more modern examples, even though these are, you know, from past history. Mm -hmm. But if you think about like the creation myths of like Greek mythology and like Roman history, right? Like those, those creation stories that were created long ago to help people explain their world mm -hmm. that people were passing down, like they weren't, those people weren't in the analytics of you know, crunching data. Right. They were sharing stories about this is this is how we came to be. This is where we came from. Like this the is Bible, who we yeah, are. This is, who this we is are. how we, like as individuals, as a community, like fit within the context of our world. And right, those, and those are big gaps to fill that these stories are doing for us. All through story, and all then verbal too. Like none of this was written, but this, um, you know, traditional retelling and passing down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And then it's so you're right. It's so it's it's not it's not just these these uh, fiction stories that uh, have influenced a handful of historically influential people. Um, this this is everybody, and so it's not only like the the writers or the the poets. Um, there's there's common myths or narratives that we tell ourselves collectively. So um, I was reading another book, Yuval Noah Harari writes in a book called Sapiens, that human communities were able to grow out of the hundreds, you know, um, outside of just directly knowing everybody in that community, which is generally like 80 to 100, maybe 150 people tops. So you're able to grow to thousands and millions of members within a community because large numbers of strangers can cooperate successfully by believing in common myths, is the way he phrases it. Um, he cites that only myths that only exist in people's collective imaginations. And he cites religion, national myths, uh, judicial or legal myths, uh, and so on. There's, there's really every angle and avenue of life is touched by some kind of story or narrative or myth that gives shape to the human imagination. And when we all share that, that allows us to combine collectively in in the thousands and in the millions and do what uh, you know a single tribe or single individual never could do. So it's not even just about that there are these stories. It's that everybody then kind of believes in that story, in that framework, and then kind of lives like within the boundaries of that, right? To like move it forward or to perpetuate it or to want to replicate it or to be a part of it. 
Exactly. Like you could think about think about nine eleven, right? This is you know something that happened, and when we think about it, we think of it happening in New York. But why do we feel connected to the millions of people who are thousands of miles away who we've never met? It's because we share the same collective interest in the American story, and we feel that our identity is interwoven with theirs. Right, that even though we live in 50 different states, we have a national identity as Americans. Mm -hmm. So that collectively, although we are different by region and location, we are a part of a bigger story. Exactly. So that story of 9-11, then you see, I actually saw a post on this recently, um, you know, it was kind of commenting on the political... (laughs) <laughs> no shortage of comments. Yeah, the political, yeah. you know, I don't even know what to call it. But the atmosphere. The atmosphere, climate, thank right. you, <laughs> happening right now. But it says, I don't want to go back to 9-11, but I want to go back to 9-12, where America came together. And it right. didn't matter what our differences were, what we believed, who we voted for. It was all about that we were all together on the same side, on the same team, finding commonality mm-hmm. instead of division. Right. And there's no shortage of division in politics when you know, have you know, rival candidates of any generation trying to distinguish themselves from one another. But there is kind of this collective story of you know, what it means to be an American. There's this shared identity. And, and so we look back through history, we try to tell that story. And sometimes we argue over that story as well. And that's one of the interesting things about you know, culture, which is really kind of founded upon these stories that we tell ourselves. That's why culture can change and can evolve. It's because stories exist within our collective imaginations, and those can change as well. And I think they should. But I don't think that they always do. And so that's where that tension lies, is that stories can change, people can change, things can shift. Mm -hmm. But if we let one story or one narrative limit us, then our potential for growth becomes stifled. Right. And then it works. And I want to talk more today because that works on the, the personal level and the small like family or community level as much as it does in the, the national and even the international level too. Okay. So there's so much to explore. I know there <laughs> we're was a little intimidated by the the breadth and depth of the topic. We were kind of you know just talking about this lightly yesterday before we decided to record today, and like I mean we were really getting into it and all the different facets of this topic and what it lends itself to. So uh, we're gonna just try and do it some justice, but we may leave with you know more questions than answers. Um, there but may be hopefully a part it inspires two. <laughs> you. Yeah, hopefully it inspires you to think about this topic a little bit more. Yeah, there's an interesting quote that I read from uh, Seth Godin. He wrote, it's a book about like marketing. Um, So he focuses, uh, the book is called All Marketers uh, Tell Stories. And he says that stories are true because we believe them. And when we, when we, give credence to a certain message or a certain idea, then it it feels like it comes true. It almost becomes like this self-fulfilling kind of narrative. And he gives examples mainly from like the marketing and from the business world, um, but that easily transcends into our own personal lives and into, you know, the larger meta narratives that we live through. Yeah. Well, and that reminds me of, if we're talking more about like um, personal narratives, Mm -hmm. it reminds me of something I read, um, Northwestern University psychologist Dan McAdams, who is an expert on what he calls the narrative identity. Um, And that is an internalized story you create about yourself. So if we're talking about stories, Mm -hmm. like let's start with like the stories that like we create about ourselves. Mm-hmm. Let's kind of start there. Right. Um, so, so for I mean, so the first thing to understand is that this isn't this isn't just other people telling us stories that we consume for entertainment. This takes on a very personal uh, level. Like we we as individuals tell ourselves certain stories. That's what you're saying. Yes, and this was something that you and I were talking about, and I hadn't really thought about it in this regard. Um, and then when I was thinking about it a little bit more, that's when I um, stumbled upon. Dan McAdams and this narrative identity. Um, If you think about it, we do tell ourselves stories about who we are. We kind of make up these stories or or we kind of limit ourselves to maybe sometimes who we think we are or we tell ourselves we're we're this kind of person. And whether that's true or not, but then we- We live it out. We live out these confirmations of these, maybe these stories that aren't accurate. So this is what he says. The stories that we create about ourselves are a selective reconstruction of the autobiographical past and a narrative anticipation of the imagined future that serves to explain, 
for the self and others, how the person came to be and where his or her life might be going. That I mean, that's sounds deep. like a professor wrote it. <laughs> yes, it does. But I read it and, you know, a light bulb went off where it's like we look at our past about like how we were raised mm-hmm. or who we were as children or what we were told by other people, whether it was like teachers or parents or family members or friends. So we have this kind of like historical baggage of like how how we are or who we're told who we are. And then we let that influence where we're think where we think we are going or headed as an adult. Mm-hmm. And then we basically live that story. We don't we don't feel the the freedom to break out of that story. We think, well, this is who I am. This is what people told me I am. Mm-hmm. This is what I say that I am. And so now I'm just gonna go on to like limit myself to this as I move forward. Well, I think part of growing up is being handed a book and I mean, no one explicitly says that, but like within that book are like the the pre-written chapters of your life. And they say like, if you, if you're doing life correctly, then you're going to tell this story that's laid out for you. And few people get to the point where they realize, well, like, wait a minute, I know I'm holding the book, but I'm also holding the pen too. And I can diverge from these pre-written chapters and begin writing chapters of my own. Yeah. And I think some of the books that were handed are good stories. Right. And they, they, they must be because we, we live them out and many of us find fulfillment in them. Right. And, you know, I think about- But that doesn't make them all good either. Right. And so I think some stories are good. Like we need those meta narratives of like who you are, or who, who you should want to be. Some of those stories are great and they help move us forward or they help um, give us a trajectory for like who we want to become. But there are also stories that even sometimes we construct ourselves that limit us. Yeah. And so being able to kind of like look at stories as both a roadmap, but also as sometimes a limitation as well. Right. And so part of, I know we come back to this in almost every episode, but part of uh, our process is really just this heightened awareness and then intentional questions that that prod at the, the stories that we tell ourselves so that we can make sure that we are telling ourselves the, the right ones or the, the ones that we actually want rather than kind of living out this narrative that's already been directed towards us. Okay. So I feel like the most, uh, speaking personally, um, the most common kind of story that I've heard, and I, I certainly was told and, and have lived out, is this this trajectory of life where like you're a kid and you uh, obey your parents and you go to school and you get good grades in school so you can go to college and you do what you can in college to get good grades and a degree and then you get a good job. And at some point within that mix, you meet someone and get married and you settle down and start a family and buy a house and then happily ever after, right? Um, well, uh, yeah, the, the 2.1 kids and the dog and the... Right. And I, you know, I've, I've, I've lived that out. And this is why I say like, not all stories are negative because I have found a great deal of fulfillment from that. Um, but I'm able to kind of look back and realize, well, there's, there's more than one path of life. That was one that was you know, laid out for me and I followed along with it and, it and it worked out. I'm grateful for that. But that doesn't have to be the only way that a life needs to be written either. And we're not that old. Like we can look ahead to the years that we have remaining and even rescript those in a way that we feel like maybe more advantageous to us too. Yeah. I mean, I would agree. I think that's part of like that traditional story. And so for us, that worked out because we met. You know what I mean? Like there are certain things that happen so that we met so that we confirm to that story. But what if you and I hadn't met at 15 and we met at 30? Mm -hmm. You know, we would have still maybe followed that pattern. Would would you still be into me? (laughs) 30-year-old you, I think, is hotter than 15-year-old you, so okay, maybe. <laughs> um, but, you know, we would have probably gone along with that story in some way, shape, or form, but it may have looked different. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of it has to do with timing, where our, like, um, our notions of when we should do things, too, along that timeline is maybe what puts pressure on people. Right. Or has them think that they're not doing it right or that it's, you know, that something's wrong with them if it doesn't happen within a certain timeline. So it's not even just the right. story. It's like the timing of things. Or like I would even say like skills and interest as well. Like I, I joke with the kids and I say, I tell them like you can be any kind of doctor that you want. 
you know, the sky's the limit. But, you know, in, in some cases, you know, people are kind of directed to go down a certain path. And once they're going down it, they realize that I'm, I'm not skillful in this area. So it's a frustrating experience or uh, I'm not interested in this. I'm more interested in, in something else. And that can also be frustrating as well. So we have these confounding factors that can get in the way of this blissful story that is kind of told, like if we go along with it, it's going to be a happy ending. Well, and I think so now that we're adults and we have kids, that was one of just some of the thoughts I had, like as parents, what are the narratives we're, we're telling our children? Mm-hmm. Now you, you, you do, you joke with our kids about like, yes, you can be any kind of doctor you want. Um, because, but where did that come from? That idea that you telling them that. Right. Even the idea of being a doctor, yeah, like, I don't know, there's, I think a societal prestige that's impressed upon people who go into the medical field. And I would like for my children to experience that <laughs> prestige. <laughs> so, but when you tell our 10-year-old that, he like, I mean, he's almost in tears. Like, I don't want to do that. Like, why do I have to be a doctor? And then you say, well, you could be a dentist, a chiropractor. Like, I mean, you like, you know, you broaden it. But I mean, the poor kid is like crushed that that's not what he wants to do. Right. But so even now as adults and thinking about our children, like how do we adjust narratives to broaden them so that we allow our children to become more of who they are and less of what we want them to be. I think a lot of adults would even like struggle answering that as adult, I mean, like as an adult children, because right, we, we for decades in our lives, like still abide by the expectations kind of put on us by our parents. And it's difficult to get away from that. So I, I think your question is it's almost like too challenging to answer because I, I feel like it's it's a lot of pressure to kind of give shape to a child's life while at the same time giving enough freedom for them to find the the story that best befits them. Yeah. Well, but I think about that a lot with our kids. Like we want what's best for them, right? Like we want the best schools, we want a happy and bright future. But maybe our picture of that for them is not the picture that they want or the picture that they're going to lead. So how do we do the best we can in raising our children without forcing them to become something that is not, you know, really who they are? Or is it part of like your parental responsibility to, you know, as the adult, like to know better than they do and to, you know, guide them in a direction that as best as we can tell as loving parents, this is the way to go. I think it's a little bit of both. <laughs> right. So I think it gets complicated. And, and maybe the, the best thing to do is kind of look at our own stories and see where we were uh, either you know successful or needed to adapt to um, you know become who we needed to be. And maybe the better we understand our own story, the more we can understand what might what approach might best be fitting for our kids. Yeah. So is that what you want to do? Do you want to look at um, some of the stories that we were told and the stories that we've told ourselves? Do you want to look at those or do you want to, you know, just talk yeah. more bigger picture? Yeah. I mean, I, I want to talk about my story a little bit because I think it's it's only really made sense to me within the last couple of years. And so, and, and that's the, the funny thing about stories is it, if we were to sit down or if we were to ask someone else, like, just to tell, t- tell me the stories you tell yourself, write them down right now, go. It, it's difficult to articulate because we we live along these lines, but it's almost like being a fish in water. Like, does the fish know that it's wet? Well, it's a difficult question because that's just how it lives. And I think that's the same with us within these stories is where that's just kind of the, the path that we go down. That's what we know. And as we live that out, we're not really aware that there's dry land or there's salt water, that there's, there's other things that are out there. So, um, so all that to say, like, oh, just the more I kind of reflect on my own upbringing and the way that I've acted in the past and uh, even more recently, I, I think it, it helps give a little bit more shape and understanding to it. So I, I would say the story that I've told myself for most of my life is that I've been um, maybe like a, maybe an underdog is the, the best term for it. Because I hung out with, I was very blessed to hang out with um, people who I, I think um, intellectually and athletically were just superior to me growing up. 
At least that's the way I felt. That's the way I perceived it. You know, I'm playing sports with with a bunch of people and I'm the last to be picked and everyone can <laughs> kind of easily, you know, outpace me or whatever. It's pretty evident that, all right, athletically, I couldn't hang with some of these people. We still had a good time together. Um, but Yeah, but okay, maybe you were not a professional athlete, but you could hang in the rec league. It's I, nothing I, I, to be ashamed hang. of. Right, right. Um, but I, I think that that idea of, so even just, you know, not just athletically, but socially and academically, just feeling like I wasn't the best or couldn't couldn't keep up with the people that I was most commonly associated with and have put a, maybe a chip on my shoulder for me to try to prove to myself and at the same time prove to everyone else that I, that I was the best. And so I remember, um, you know, in school, like I, I pushed myself to like be the fastest reader. Well, why? Like who cared if I could read faster? But I wanted to try to prove something. And I remember, you ever play that game around the world, like with the math facts? Yeah. So you go like one-on-one against every kid in the class with the like, you know, the two times eight and whoever can answer it faster moves on. And I, I won that game like all the time growing up until I got to fifth grade. And, and then, and this is kind of the wrenching thing too, when someone messes up your story that you're trying to tell yourself, then it's like, it's mind blowing. But there was this new kid who came in the fifth grade and he beat me and he beat like the whole class. And I literally cried in class and the teacher's like, it's just a game. I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> but for me, like I, I was, I was no longer the best. And then like once, once we met, you kind of made fun of me. Cause you're like, you're always like reading books and trying to like, you know, outsmart the other people in the room. And, and when we played games, like I got, I became such a jerk when I played games because I wanted to win. I became this hyper competitive kind of person. And I think a lot of that was to kind of prove that I, I wasn't at the bottom, that I was, I was worthy, that I was at the top. And I've, I've certainly matured since then. But that didn't stem from anybody else's perception of you. It was the story in your own mind that if you weren't the best, then you were not, you weren't anything. And I couldn't hang with the people who were, and I didn't have, I didn't have a place. So the story you told yourself it was really, I mean, it wasn't a lie, but it was like this twisted view of like who you thought you needed to be. Well, and that's the thing about stories is that we we tell them to ourselves, but they are not, they, they don't exist anywhere beyond our own imagination. And okay. there's a, a confounding, uh, or not confounding, there's, a, um, there, there, there's a, a bias that we have when we look back back on our memory. So if we tell ourselves story A, then when we look back in our past, we're kind of cherry picking all the details that confirm story A. And like just that confirmation bias of like this, this is true because if you look at all these details and I don't know if like if you've ever been in a conversation or heard a conversation where someone's like, oh, I'm, I'm just, this is who I am. And the other person's like, no, no, no. And then they're able to point out an equal number of contrary details to prove that they're, they're really, you know, someone else and trying to build them up, you know. And it's difficult to pay attention to those things when the story that you're telling yourself, it doesn't align with those details. And so I, I feel like even just my cognizance of this explains my own behavior and then gives me a little bit more empowerment to, I think, make more uh, rational decisions or to kind of reinvent that narrative a little bit better so that I can you know, become who I want to be rather than follow along the same pattern the rest of my life. Okay. So part of your personal narrative is this idea of this chip on your shoulder and trying to prove that you are better than what? Be- prove that I'm better than what I'm afraid I am. Wow. That's pretty deep. <laughs> <laughs> so I've thought about this. So I'm glad I can yeah. articulate this for us. Okay. Um, so if I go back to like the stories that I've been told um, and that kind of shaped the way that I was like raised or grew up, I think – I would be remiss to not talk about like this kind of like immigrant story and not of me, but of my parents. So I am first generation American. Um, Neither of my parents were born in this country. Um, My dad came here as a teenager um, from Italy when he was 13 and spoke no English. Um, But they left Italy and were able to come here because they had a family member that was already here that vouched for my dad and his family, his three siblings, his two parents. And they came here Mm -hmm. and lived with those relatives until they could kind of like get set up 
and be on their own. So it was this very like long drawn out process. Mm -hmm. My dad comes here at 13 years old, speaks no English. And, you know, all under this umbrella that if you come to America, you will have a better life. Your life will be better. The life of your children will be better. Mm -hmm. There is more opportunity. So that's sort of like this international story about America that had been told. And it, it kind of becomes true because you have people like your parents' families that believed in it and did their best to live that out. Right. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. And then- then as each generation is here for longer, the the opportunity becomes greater. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, obtaining more and better is easier. And so um, my mom also uh, was not born here. Um, she was born and then actually grew up um, part of her childhood in England. She was born in Italy, lived in England. Lived in England. So learned to speak English, mm-hmm. although her parents did not. British English. British English. And my mom, unfortunately, does not have... Um, <laughs> An English accent, which is, you know, a little sad, but she used to have one when she was a little girl. Um, (laughs) Nonetheless, um, so even interesting, their part of her story is that she moves somewhere and is like this other, where her parents speak no English. She learns to speak English growing up, translating for them, then comes here when she's a little bit older, same thing, coming to stay with another family here because they hear that, you know, at the time Italy was poor, they left Italy for England, and then ultimately that coming here would be better. And so growing up, Um, although I am white and Mm -hmm. American born here, I never felt like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, I always felt different. I didn't associate with those, not associate, but like identify as much with those people around me. Like the culture of your friends, the culture at school was different than what you would go home and experience. Right. Like very, very, I would say very much American. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but like Mm -hmm. I felt different among them. When I went to their houses and saw their family, like my family life was different. Mm -hmm. Um, And looking back, I would say all I wanted to do was be like everybody else. But now I realize how like rich and full Mm -hmm. my childhood experience was. But from both of my parents, I always got this understanding that same thing, you will go to school, you will learn, like it's your job to go to school and learn and get a good education and you'll do the same in high school. And then from high school, you will go to college. My parents did not have the opportunity to go to college. Like that, that was not a part of their story. So this was part of, so I mean, your story, I think that the breadth of it is a little bit broader in the sense that it kind of begins even with your grandparents kind of making the decision to come here for a better life for grandchildren they hadn't even met yet. And then they try to you know, do what they can for their kids. And then your parents end up having children of their own. And finally, you're kind of fulfilling that where you are able to go to college, you um, you know, have like a, a house and a career and a gorgeous husband and all, you know, all the important <laughs> all things even, that they had envisioned. But, I mean, yeah, you're fast forwarding, but even how important it was for me to go to college to my parents, mm-hmm. like that was a big deal. Like part of the reason why even when they were here and they worked and they struggled to like to make ends meet was like, because they were going to work that hard so that when the time came to go to college, they could help me go to college. Mm-hmm. And that what opportunity that I had that they didn't that would make my life better, that their life was good, but now my life will be better. And then when I have kids, like mm-hmm. like each generation is more educated and is more motivated and is loved and supported by their parents to do these great things that like that our namesake will continue to rise. I think that that is a part of it. And I think a, another piece of it too is that letting the next generation know where they've come from as best as possible too. Right, because our our kids will know your grandma and your parents and be able to articulate that story. Um, but their their kids, I mean, who you know, who knows to what extent they'll be able to themselves have that relationship. So how do we carry on that that multi generational narrative? Yeah, and even my parents say this is why we work so hard. This is why we save. This is why we're not taking a vacation. Like there were certain things that were told. And like through that, we learned about like hard work and discipline and doing without and sacrifices that need to be made and and ways to live in which will empower us and get us to the point where we will be able to do the same things for our family. And so, um, yeah, growing up, like I didn't identify with those kids. I was, I was different. And so um, even now, and I, I would joke, like, I'm like, sometimes I don't want to, like, I don't want to check the box, like, white. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm 
something like you different. understand what that is, but that's not entirely. Right. Yeah. Right. Like where it's, there's this identity, there's this, there's this story that I've been told of who I am. And sometimes even checking that box for me doesn't feel right. Right. And I used to think I was Italian until I started hanging out with you guys. I'm, <laughs> I'm Jordan, the hot dog Catapano. <laughs> well, I'm more American now, but still <laughs> right. I, I see the, the power of like history and generations and, um, language and nationality and how that affects who you think you are yeah. in relation to other people. Right. And so it's interesting because I mean, we're talking about kind of the stories that we we grew up on and eventually came to believe in and tell ourselves. But it's it's interesting to note how much of our stories can also come from the people around us, like namely from our family and from our like immediate community, those who we're interacting with on a regular basis. The people who treat us certain ways or the people who have certain expectations for us. And even if it's not explicitly verbalized, like there's still assumptions and expectations and narratives that are embedded in the way we interact. Um, do you have an example of like what that looks like? No, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm kind Is it of more of like a question building off of what you're saying too. Like there's kind of this, I, you, you didn't just on your own decide like this is my family's story and this is how I'm going to operate in this. This is something that this is kind of the the way that your family shared their message of their story and wanted to pass that on to you. Right. So I'm saying like so so stories can come from ourselves but they also have a lot of like external influence on us too. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um even if you look at now okay, let's fast forward my story. So then um, I did go to college. I got a degree, right? I um, taught high school English for a while. Um, part of my story I always knew was that I wanted to like have a family and be a mom. Mm -hmm. And then at the time of having kids, um, we made the decision that I would stay home with our kids. And that was like one that I was fully on board with. But even now, okay, now I've been home 10 years, like out of the classroom, not teaching. I've um, kind of transitioned what I went to school for in my career into something completely different, mm -hmm. um, doing event planning and wedding coordination and still at home with my kids, still doing that on the side. But one of the things that you've kind of told me is that, you know, we made a decision and this was part of our story, but that this is not what my life um, has to conform to moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so we've talked about how there's a, um, a story for us and a plan, but we don't have to feel confined to that if at some point we grow out of that story mm -hmm. or we want to shift what the future looks like, we don't need to let past stories or decisions confine us into those roles. Right. And I think that's a really hard shift to make because uh, sometimes we get a picture in our head of how it's supposed to go. And we we try to, it's almost like a shirt, like you try it on and um, you know naturally if it doesn't fit, then you can take it off. But with stories, it's a little bit harder. You try it on and because they they... So, uh, they're elusive, right? They're intangible. It's a little bit harder to, you know, take that off and, and put a different shirt on, especially when you're doing that in the midst of a marriage and with children. But like we've said, like we don't have to be the same kind of parents for our first child that we are for our fourth. We're going to be a good parent either way, but it doesn't have to conform to that same narrative of parenting. And that's something that you and I have talked a lot about as I've struggled through this because I, although I want to be a mom, I want to be the same mom for my fourth kid as I was for my first, but it's also not fair to like my own goals and aspirations. Mm -hmm. But I, for the last two years, have had a hard time struggling with, could I, you know, I mean, if things were different, three of our kids would be in school full time <laughs> and we'd have one um, left at home, right. you know. God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> would I, you know, put him in daycare or find a nanny for him so that I could right. begin working more? And not because I don't want to be a mom and not because I don't love him, but now I've not been working for 10 years. I'm kind of looking forward to a little bit more of my own thing. Right. But then it would these, make you even a, a, a better mom in some ways. But even the stories that I've told myself that I'm going to have these kids and I'm going to raise them and I'm not going to outsource them, sometimes I let that kind of, um, keep me from doing what I want to do because I feel the tension of this is who I said I was or this is what my mom did when I was young and mm -hmm. and not that I need to do anything to please people, but I'm letting it confine maybe what's next for me. 
You know, that reminds me of, um, you know, looking at, just looking back at some things we've studied for education and like the growth mindset. Um, so Carol Dweck was the, like the researcher first kind of publicized this, but this idea of having a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. And uh, a fixed mindset is basically saying, I am who I am and I'm, I'm stuck that way. And this is where we get a lot of maybe some of the, the stories that we tell ourselves that we, we feel confined in. Um, and so you hear a lot of students saying things like, oh, I'm, I'm just not good at, I'm just not a math person. Um, you know, those, those kinds of statements where it's like, this is, this is who I am. I am also just not a math person. Right. <laughs> and so we, we tell those things about ourselves. So what happens in the next math class? Well, then we don't do so well because we're kind of living out in the self-fulfilling kind of way what we believe to be true about ourselves. Right. And then the growth mindset is the reverse of that, where basically you put the yet at the end of any sentence. I'm not, I'm not a great math person yet, but we do believe in the, just the, the power of ourselves to learn and to adapt to whatever the circumstance is. And so I think about that just in terms of our, our skills and what we believe about ourselves, but also, you know, we can kind of have this fixed mindset about the way life needs to look. And it's like, it, it just needs to look this way where we realize with maybe a more growth mindset mentality that there, there are other ways that it could look and still be just as good and just as fulfilling. Um, but it does require kind of this, this leap of faith to believe in ourselves to carry that out. Yeah, it's like that. Um, should we go to the Godfather again? I don't think it would be a Relentless Pursuit episode without okay, at least right? one Godfather um, What does What reference. does he say? Um, like that you think old, like Penza Antique. Oh, yeah. Right? When uh, they're talking to is the, the the Turk and Michael Corleone is speaking Sicilian. Yeah. So he's trying to explain to Michael Corleone that uh, your dad is old fashioned. Yeah. He's got an old school mentality. Du padre Penza Antique. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like this old school thinking where like it has to be this way or it has to be this way because that's what I've been told or that's what I've told told myself. You know, there's another quote that says, whether you think you can or you you can't, you're right. Mm -hmm. And so if you think you can't, you're never going to get there. But if you think you can, then you just have to work towards it. But yeah, you're not going to get anywhere or get any further if you're always confirming that you're, you're not that person when you very well could be. Yeah. A funny story I remember from uh, being a kid where I was, I think I was playing basketball with my dad. So it was one of my dad's in, you know, life lessons that you never believe at the time. And then you get older, you're like, oh, that was pretty good. So he's like, he's like, do you know why Michael Jordan plays so well? I'm like, well, I don't know. Cause he's really good. Uh, he practices a lot. He's like, well, he does those things, but he plays so well because he has more confidence in himself than his opponent has in themselves. He's like, so you need to have confidence in your ability to, you know, kind of defeat your opponent or to carry out this skill. We were talking exclusively about basketball. So I remember like I'm trying to play against my friends. I'm like, I'm trying to talk myself up. <laughs> I believe in myself. I, I can do it. I'm better than this guy. And then they'd still steal the ball and you know, whatever. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my dad is full of it, whatever. Um, but there is, I mean, there's, there's kind of this interesting science behind self-talk as well. And a lot of, a lot of really successful people almost have like a little mantra that they repeat to themselves or some kind of little monologue that they write down and, um, just read to themselves each morning or, you know, certain things to try to make sure that they are telling themselves the right narrative or the narrative that they feel is the one that they actually want to live out. Do you have a mantra or something in the back of your mind now that that kind of inspires, not even inspires you, but just is a truth that you tell yourself that you remind yourself in order to like move forward and be who you are? There's there's certain things. So, so this is again, like kind of like newer narratives that I've had. There's some small things that sometimes you ever have this, like somebody says something about you, or they compliment you in some way, and you'd never really thought about that before, but then you you remember that and try to be that every time. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just use that as a build up, um, just as a minor example, like someone had once told me years ago, like, you're a really good hugger. I'm like, I'm a good hugger. Okay. People tell you that all the time though. Like people have well, recently told you that, like, he's such a good hugger. Right. And so I, I don't, you can't even really tell which one comes first. Was I always a good hugger? And, <laughs> and, you know, people are finally noticing, or was it the reverse where maybe I gave like one, you know, good hug, whatever a good hug is. And, um, you know, that person kind of noticed that said something. And now 
am I living to affirm that? It almost doesn't matter what comes first, but that's something I, I believe about myself and something I do. Um, I, I can't even say I do it intentionally, but I feel like that's that's something true about myself. So if someone came along and and so you know people were like, oh, this person, they're a good hugger. I, I would be like, well, wait a minute, I thought I was a good hugger, you know. <laughs> um, so that that's like more of a, a minor instance, but I think there's other things just in the way like we uh, just believe about ourselves in, in different areas of our lives. Like I think of um, like at work, one of the things that I believe that I can do and I try to live out is uh, bringing people together, like in the spirit of collaboration. I don't I don't think I have very many good I, like ideas on my own, but what I'm in a group of people and trying to bring out what they have to say from their different experiences and just walks of life or whatever then I feel like we get a lot of traction and can produce something of value. I think of the stories that like you and I tell about us, like how does our story go? We've said it thousands of times over the years, I think, right? Like we, we met, it was love at first sight. You can keep your eyes off of me. Um, and <laughs> we, we, right. We, we just, clicked and there was never any discord there was never um kind of this this question of is she the right one is he the right one um, right not even four years at separate colleges like there was not even no when we were apart right yeah. and then you know we got married or we got engaged and then we got married and um, i think have reminded ourselves of that history that we share but also this kind of simplicity to our love where we never have to question that with one another no matter what issue or strife may come up like so there's there's those foundations of who we have always been with one another that go unquestioned and rightly so so that we can you know continue to build beautiful things off of that foundation yeah i would agree <laughs> so uh, going back to um I guess I have like two two questions one of them we sort of touched upon which was how do we um how do we how, how are we sharing narratives or expectations with others like if we said part of what influences the way we see the world is how other people are kind of dictating those expectations or those stories to us we've got to be a part of that too what are the stories or expectations that we are dictating to others our children or otherwise how like what's the right mind frame to have as we go about you know, I think we live in a time of a lot of comparison. And so I naturally love to hear people's stories and I love how different people's stories are. Like it doesn't even matter like what their story is about or how they came to be where they are. Like I'm just genuinely interested because although ours fits like a certain story or a pattern, like I love stories that don't. Mm -hmm. I love stories that are surprising. I love underdog stories. I like stories of struggle. Like I love learning about people and their histories. And so like when People will say, well, you know, my story is not like yours. Like I didn't meet. And like people will actually say like in like parenthesis, my Jordan when I was 15. <laughs> like, you know, like it's like almost like everybody aspires to that story. And I, and I guess the way that I deal with, with stories and like the stories that were told and what people tell me is that I tell them like, but it doesn't have to be like that. Where mm -hmm. I guess the way that I operate is mine is always like um, negating like the, like what it has to be. Mm. And, and just telling them like, well, yeah, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be like that. And so I think that's just more of my mindset where it's like, I'm never trying to like tell people what their story should be mm -hmm. as much as I'm like empowering them to like be okay with the fact that their story is different or that it's unconventional mm -hmm. and bringing out like the things that I admire within their story that not that I wish that I had went through or could emulate, but like that I want to learn from and apply to my story going forward so that I am stronger, bigger, bolder, wiser. Yeah. And I think that plays an important role because we we have had those conversations where people have pointed out, it's like, oh, you guys have known each other since you were kids. And and um, I think we're not, I mean, it's not like we're going around like telling everybody that story, but there's kind of certain things about, I would say, like just who you're exposed to that uh, kind of shape what that story that you tell yourself is going to be. And like they say, you should hang around um, people that you aspire to be like, or take a look at the five people you spend most of your time with. You're going to be the sixth one who's just like those other five. 
So, I, I mean, one of the other things I was going to bring up was how do we change our story if we don't like the way that it's turned out? And I think that that would be one of the things that I would challenge myself and any listeners to do too, is to talk about and examine who are you spending time with? What are the stories they're living out? And in what ways can you be around the kinds of people whose way of living out their life and viewing their story is admirable to you. Yeah, I would agree. It uh, reminds me of this quote, and I've used it a ton um, with just friends who have felt um, maybe frustrated with where they are or where they aren't yet, and even at times like where I felt I am. Um, Mm. So are you always like sharing quotes with friends? I am not. (laughs) But like sometimes when I send... I'm the kind of person who's like, we'll send a card if someone is struggling yeah. or like if I could tell that they like need a word. Sometimes my words are good and mm-hmm. some people will tell me like, oh, yeah. but sometimes like I don't have the words. And so this this quote I have used before several times and it's by F. Scott Fitzgerald. So it says, for what it's worth, it's never too late or in my case, too early to be whoever you want to be. There's no time limit. Start whenever you want. You can change or stay the same. There are no rules to this thing. We can make the best of it or the worst of it. I hope you make the best of it. I hope you see things that startle you. I hope you feel things you've never felt before. I hope you meet people who have a different point of view. I hope you live a life you're proud of. And if you're not, I hope you have the courage to start over again. Mm. And so um, I think I wrote that in a card to my mom and recited a part of it um, on the day that she retired this year, Hmm. that her life has been what it's been until this point, but now she's starting like a new chapter to her life. Mm -hmm. And so maybe some of it was good and some of it was great and maybe some of it wasn't, Mm -hmm. but it was like this inspiration that like, that was the story. That was your story until this point, Mm -hmm. but you have this, this life ahead of you now, you know, 62 years and forward. What do you want it to be? Who do you want to be? Mm-hmm. And and starting to write that story and finding the people and the the situations that will inspire you to be bolder, greater, wiser. Right. Okay. That reminds me of uh, the Bob Dylan song. I was like, like, may God bless and keep you always. May your wishes all come true. Forever Young, yes, by Bob Dylan. <laughs> Maybe that doesn't have anything to do with F. Scott Fitzgerald. But it... <laughs> It's kind of this idea of like, you know, what, like wishing well to someone, but that, that wellness, you know, and that, that spirit of, of goodness can come with just kind of exploring the, the realm of possibilities within life and finding the ones that are most favorable to your own fulfillment. Yeah. Or what you have been doesn't have to be what you're going to be. Right. The, the right story can inspire you and propel you and the wrong one can confine you confine you and restrain you. Yeah. So I think that's a lot to digest in this conversation and it certainly gives us a lot to think about as we continue to tell ourselves stories um, and as we continue to kind of write the story of us and pass on stories and expectations to our children. But what are those stories that you've told yourself that you live to confirm even though they may not be 100% true? Like mm-hmm. now is the time to kind of break those own myths that we've created about herself, ourselves. I'm never going to be this, or I'm always going to be like that. Like, we have a choice in the matter, right? We are predisposed to being certain ways, right? Um, I'm never going to be six foot five and, you know, a point guard for the Chicago Bulls, but that doesn't mean that I cannot be a good basketball player. Mm-hmm. There are certain things that, you know, li- that may limit us, but that does not need to confine us to who we who we can be in the future. Exactly. And well, we're interested in hearing some of your thoughts as well. So as always, um, please feel free to stay in touch. And we hope you enjoyed today's conversation about the stories we tell ourselves. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to today's show. We hope you will use this conversation as a starting point for your own. We hope you're encouraged to think and act more intentionally. If you want to learn more, you can visit our website, therelentlesspursuitpodcast.com where you can find notes on today's show, plus additional blog posts, and you can subscribe to our free members list. Please subscribe, leave a review, and share with your friends. Facebook and Instagram are two great places to connect with us for daily doses of our quotable quotes, behind the scenes, and real-time photos, videos, and challenges. Until next time, let us know how you are taking life off autopilot and relentlessly pursuing what matters.